All right, hi, my name is Anna Mayoni. I work at Matt Tech Corporation, and today I'm going to be talking about an in vitro respiratory model for acute inhalation toxicity testing. So at Matt Tech, um, we produce uh, three different uh, varieties of 3D in vitro respiratory tissues. Um, uh, the first is uh, Epi Airway um, and Epi Airway Full Thickness, so these are models of the upper respiratory tract, uh, and also Epi Aveolar, which is a model of the alveolar um, epithelial tissue. So a general scheme for how these tissues are produced, um, we take cells isolated from lung tissue, we expand them in monolayer, and then we cryopreserve them as a large um, bank of cells. So then we can uh, thaw these uh, cells, um, seed them onto a microporous insert membrane uh, submerged in uh, culture media, and then um, airlift them so that they're only fed with media from the basal side and they're exposed to air on the apical surface. And this um, facilitates their differentiation into a nice pseudostratified epithelial tissue. So to provide some more background on our epi airway model, um, this is our um, organotypic model of the um, human tracheal bronchial uh, epithelial tissue. So this is composed of uh, primary uh, human epithelial cells, again, which are grown at the air-liquid interface. Um, we have over 35 donors available um, from various different backgrounds, including both healthy donors and disease donors, um, and also smokers. We can produce these tissues on a variety of insert formats, including high throughput plates. Our tissues are highly reproducible and stable for long-term culture, and we can ship them worldwide. And um, on our website, you'll see that we have over 100 technical references for the epiary model. So to provide um, some more detail on the characterization of this model and how it recapitulates um, the in vivo microenvironment, um, you can see here some uh, uh, cross-sections where you see a nice pseudostratified um, epithelial tissue on the microporous membrane, the basal cells, which are uh, staining positive for keratin-5. You can also see that there are goblet cells present, um, which are producing mucus. Um, so you can see uh, blue staining for alcium blue and um, goblet cells um, staining positive for MUC5AC, which is a mucin. These tissues also um, form an intact barrier, um, as shown by um, trans epithelial electrical resistance values greater than uh, 300 ohms per centimeter squared. And also, um, this is a top down view um, of E cadherin staining, um, showing that there are uh, intact tight junctions. These tissues also have actively beating cilia. Um, you can see an SEM image here of the cilia on the surface of the tissue. Uh, and beta tubulin marking the ciliated cells. And this uh, is actually a, a video showing uh, the beating cilia and the mucus flowing across the, the surface of the tissue. So you can see mucus particles here flowing across, and the flickering that you see is actually the um, beating cilia. The other um, model that we offer is um, the airway full thickness model. So this is very similar to the at the airway model, except it includes a stromal compartment, um, which is composed of an extracellular matrix um, with fibroblasts. And then um, our newer model, which is called epiavular, which is a model of the alveolar tissue, um, this is a little more complex. So we actually um, seed endothelial cells on the basal surface of the um, microporous insert. And then on the apical side, we have both um, fibroblasts and epith alveolar epithelial cells, and we can also include macrophages um, if needed. So our airway models have, are um, used for a variety of different applications. Uh, they can be used for toxicity studies, uh, viral and bacterial infection, um, drug delivery, uh, inflammation, fibrosis, et cetera. And you can see a more complete list um, with references on our website. And because these tissues are all grown at the air-liquid interface, um, they lend themselves to a variety of different exposure methods. Um, so you can add your treatment to the basal media, 
to mimic a more systemic uh, exposure, or your um, test article of interest can be exposed on the apical surface, either um, as a liquid cream or powder, um, so that the tissue is submerged, or at the air-liquid interface, um, if it's a gas vapor or aerosol. And um, Vitrocell produces a variety of different exposure systems for exposing at the air-liquid interface. Following exposure, we can assess um, the tissues with a variety of different endpoints, uh, including barrier function, uh, viability, gene and protein expression, um, mucus production, et cetera. So the application I'm going to be focused on today is um, our epi airway test for acute inhalation toxicity. And um, more details can be found in our recent publication in Applied In Vitro Toxicology. So inhalation is a major route of exposure um, to potentially toxic chemicals, whether it be um, an occupational exposure, environmental exposure, or um, household exposure in the case of uh, consumers. So there's a significant need to be able to assess uh, the safety and risk um, of inhaled um, chemicals. So different regulatory agencies have different uh, schemes for classifying um, acute inhalation toxicity. So shown here is the globally harmonized system, or GHS. Um, there's also an EPA system uh, for classifying these chemicals, but I'm, I'm going to be focusing just on the GHS system for this talk. So category ones and twos are the extremely dangerous chemicals, which will be uh, fatal if inhaled, and the categories threes, fours, and fives um, are less dangerous, maybe irritating, um, or toxic. The global harmonized system also has um, a secondary classification scheme called specific target organ toxicity single exposure. Um, so these are non-lethal toxic effects on specific organs following a single exposure. Um, and the primary source of this classification is um, human data. Um, so whether it be case studies or epidemiology studies, um, these category ones are going to um, cause significant damage to uh, an organ. So the way a chemical is classified into these different categories um, relies mainly on an animal test um, based on um, the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development uh, test guidelines, so the OECD test guideline, um, which primarily relies on the RAT LD50 test. So uh, the animal is exposed for four hours, and then after 14 days, uh, lethality is assessed to determine the concentration at which 50% of the animals die. Um, and this can be repeated with a different, additional concentrations as necessary. So there are um, significant drawbacks to using this animal testing method. Um, first of all, it's not always predictive of a human response. Um, the primary endpoint is lethality, so you're missing a lot of the non-lethal effects, which might not be ideal for safety assessment. It's also not um, providing any mechanistic information, so you don't know if the lethality is caused by uh, a systemic effect or a local effect on the lung tissue. And of course, there are also species-specific differences in response, um, the way the animals breathe and uh, the deposition. Uh, the second significant drawback is that there's ethical concerns about using animals and increasing regulatory pressure to avoid the use of animals. And lastly, um, these tests are very inefficient. Um, they're costly and time consuming to conduct. There's a lot of variability between tests and there's a poor ability to control the delivery uh, and dosing of these inhaled chemicals. So there's a great need to develop alternative non-animal testing strategies for looking at acute inhalation tox. So our goal was to use our epi airway model to develop an alternative in vitro, in vitro toxicity test method. So the method that we developed um, was to take our uh, chemical of interest and prepare a four-point dose curve 
either in water or corn oil, and then apply it onto the apical surface of the tissue and incubate for three hours and then examine tissue viability using the MTT assay. So the data I'm going to show you today is um, 59 of the chemicals that we've tested. They had a range of different inhalation toxicities. Um, and then based on our four-point dose curve for each chemical, we determined an IC75 value. So this is the dose at which the tissues are 75% viable. And then we correlated the calculated IC75 values <clears throat> with, <clears throat> excuse me, the rat in vivo uh, LD50 data based on the GHS category to develop a prediction model. <clears throat> so we also um, compared against the EPA classification scheme, um, which you can find in our paper, but I'm not going to show it um, uh, in this presentation. So here is the data, just to orient you. We have the GHS um, classification um, categories on the bottom. This is based on the um, RAT LD50 data. On the y-axis, we have the Epi Airway IC75 values. And then each of the points is a different chemical that we tested. We um, made a cutoff of 150 milligrams per mil um, to separate highly toxic versus less toxic chemicals. Um, and then we can look at how these, how our values compare to the GHS classification scheme. So you can see that our cutoff uh, value of 150 correctly identifies eight out of eight or 100% of the highly toxic category one and two um, GHS categories. So these are the significantly um, toxic and lethal chemicals. Um, the specificity of this test was 43% and the overall accuracy was 51%. Um, so you can see that there's a whole grouping of, tish of chemicals that have very low IC75 values by the Epi Airway test, but um, based on the GHS classification with the RAT LD50 data, um, these are not classified as um, particularly toxic chemicals. So we wanted to understand what these chemicals were and why the rat test may be missing um, these chemicals. So um, to illustrate this, I'm going to uh, give two specific examples. The first um, is acetic acid. So here you can see it has an very low IC75 value in the Epi Airway test, but based on the RAT data, it is only a category five in the GHS classification. However, when we look at that secondary classification scheme, the specific target organ toxicity system, um, we can see that acetic acid, while it's a GHS category five, the, the STOT classification is actually one and it's known to be a, both a skin and an eye corrosive. And when we looked at some of these additional chemicals, um, and this is an abbreviated list, many of them come up as um, skin and eye corrosive and an STOT category one. So this is indicating that the RAT LD50 test may be missing a lot of these respiratory corrosives um, based on known skin and eye data and also the STOT classification scheme. The second um, example is diethylamine. So again, a very low IC75 value, but only a class, uh, classification of four on the GHS um, scheme based on the RAT LD50 data. Uh, so you can see this in the safety data sheet. It's considered a category four. However, further down on the safety data sheet, you can see that there are notes that this causes significant upper respiratory tract irritation. And again, um, it's actually classified as category one under the STOT um, classification uh, system. So it seems that not only is the RAT LD50 test missing those corrosives, it may also be missing uh, respiratory irritants. So to kind of summarize, um, we're, we feel that there are significant advantages to using 
the uh, epi airway test over the RAT LD50 test. Um, we feel that it's going to be more predictive um, because it does correctly identify 100% um, of these highly toxic chemicals, these category ones and twos, um, which is going to be really important for hazard um, and risk assessment. Um, but it is also successfully identifying both respiratory corrosives and respiratory irritants based on the GHS uh, single target organ toxicity um, and the SDS data that were not um, picked up by the rat test. Furthermore, it also eliminates interspecies differences, so there's a better potential um, to translate to the human experience. And it's also a much simpler test um, to conduct, so it's very fast and easy dosing, um, which will make it higher throughput and cost effective, and it doesn't have the associated animal ethical concerns. So there's still um, ongoing work on this project. Um, one of the main outstanding questions is how we are going to use the epi airway test to distinguish between those uh, category one and two chemicals um, that cause systemic toxicity and um, the respiratory corrosives and irritants. Um, so we're looking into a tier testing approach using um, the skin corrosion test in conjunction with the epi airway test, um, potentially incorporating read across and chemical properties into um, a decision-making tree and um, including additional endpoints um, such as looking into mechanistic experience, uh, experiments which might be causing um, the toxicity. The next step is to um, refine and finalize our prediction model with additional chemicals and to conduct uh, inter-laboratory ring trials on a subset of these chemicals so that we can submit um, to the OECD. And in the future, we hope that we can extend um, this uh, test in the epi airway system to subchronic and chronic inhalation toxicity tests by using a repeat dosing strategy. Uh, so with that, I want to acknowledge the airway group here at MATTECH. Um, this work was conducted um, primarily by Dr. Patrick Hayden, uh, Rob Jackson, Rob Jackson and Michelle DeBatis, and was funded um, by NIEHS grant. Um, I'm also putting up some uh, different references um, so you can do further reading. If you're interested in more information on the MAT Tech models, you can visit our website um, or email myself or Dr. Patrick Hayden here. All right, thank you for your time.